Sure, well, that's quite a long story. Um, you know, I was uh, raised in Switzerland and there I did first after school, I did an apprentice as a tool maker, which was precise metal tooling. And this is actually my very good fundament for machines, mechanics and so on. And after that I worked in the watch industry, but more as a constructor designer. And uh, for two years and then somehow <coughs> I had enough of the, all this industry and I went to study electric bass guitar and yeah. piano since I was always, music was always my biggest love. I did the jazz uh, school in Luzern in Switzerland. During that time I developed another, another style on my instrument. So I made more performance music for performances and arts and so on. So I changed and that brought me actually to the Netherlands, to the Royal Conservatory in The Hague. What it really turned me around completely was that they had somehow the roots of the Bauhaus system from the 20s, 30s. And it was basically a free art school. I had to do one art project per year. For the rest I was totally free and it was quite crazy as well. And so there I really changed my mind completely. <laughs> I learned there is always a gap between art and artists and the industry. That's a different talk. Because you know artists, they go to the industry and they always ask these crazy things that the industry is not interested in or the industry says, well, I can get you this, but only if you need a thousand pieces or so. And so I did... Uh, I made a little company actually where I tried to bridge this gap between these two. And then somehow I got to know Wax Society. And I thought that's a very interesting um, institute. And uh, there was a friend of mine working here upstairs in the theater as a technician. And then I asked him, because I was so much in love with the building as well, I asked him if you ever have uh, a gap, I would love to help come to work here. And that's how it started here. At some point, six years ago, seven years ago, they bought uh, a laser cutter. And at that time, I hadn't got a clue what that is, but I had to move it always on different locations. And then this whole make thing and open design came up here and I found it interesting. So I just went to my boss and said, listen, I think I have the perfect background to be, to managing this because I talk the industrial talk and I'm very technical as well, but uh, I'm also an artist, so it's nice to combine all these things. Uh, actually, I f found it in the end, yeah. the Fab Amsterdam, and uh, yeah, it was a long way because I mean, I had to learn the stuff my, myself first. I did also one of the very first Fab Academy schools, which is now quite the established program. Whatever we develop, whatever project, we involve the end user from the very first stage. And I think that is very important. So it means that if I make a special device for you, I need your input what, what you want, not what I want. And that's very important. I mean, I could try to explain what the Wow Society does in one hour, but if I would say it in one sentence, it would be that we try to make um, technology accessible for everyone. You know this hassle that if you buy a device and then you got this huge manual and you need to read first for two hours until you can understand the device, that's exactly uh, not the goal. You know, The goal is that the device is so good that it explains it itself. What we do often is uh, workshops where we teaching the basics but also uh, it depends, you know, we do a lot of workshops also, uh, formats that specific clients want us to do. And uh, for instance, one of the aspects I like is what we call pressure cooker scenes. If you have, say, 20 people, you're dividing them in five groups and every group got, get a theme what to do. So you, the pressure cooker means that you don't give them much time to think about the concept, but you give them maybe, say, 20 minutes. 
So each group has 20 minutes and then you do already a pitch of five minutes. So every group has to present their concept. After the presentations, you swap the projects in the groups. So the next group comes in with the concept and has a really fresh view of it and is doing like a second iteration of it. And then again, there are uh, uh, pitches and then it's about prototyping. But then I switch again. And I think this is really like a true open design experience where I believe in and I saw all these people being really refreshed by this uh, way of working. Because you have to, the, the, you know the crucial thing is that you have to take away your ego. Yeah. That's very important. And I think it works brilliantly well. Yeah, well, I have to admit the prosthesis is still in development, but that's a nice story. I have many friends in Indonesia, and that was prior, it had nothing to do with the Fab Lab. But they were a kind of amazing community of makers, and really like architects, urbanists, fashion designers. At some point, I told them about the concept of Fab Labs because I was thinking myself, if I could give them, in a way, all these tools, they would go totally crazy. It would be amazing. You know, they could make their stuff even nicer. And so, uh, I told them about the concept, and they said, "Yeah, we would like to have a, such a lab as well." And so, they came up. They came up with this concept of uh, prosthesis because. Uh, uh, there is a big demand in uh, Indonesia about low cost prosthesis, uh, not low cost prosthesis, but prosthesis in general, lower leg uh, prosthesis. And uh, the process of making them, and I've seen that, is very slow. So there's thousands of people that they haven't got the prosthesis because they don't have it. They cannot walk, they cannot go to the market, so they get staying home, getting alienated, and it's a very uh, touching subject. And so I thought that would be amazing, you know, let's try to develop a, a lower cost leg, a low cost, a low knee leg, but with it, which, which is intelligent, but using local material. So we set up a program of three years uh, uh, collaborating on that, so we did half the development here in Amsterdam and half the develop we went there. So I went up and there, up and down there, and they came to us as well, and we did workshops. We were gathering a group of specialists to work with us, because I'm not an orthoped, so who I am to design a leg. But with the input of these uh, uh, specialists, we were able to uh, develop this lower leg. And as I said, we are still busy with it, it's complicated. but. The great goal is that it will be self-adjustable and that is again a use as design strategy. We think if you wear a prosthesis 24-7, you are a specialist because you're wearing it day and night. The best thing is you, can, you have to make friends with your prosthesis, so you love your prosthesis. So imagine if you can walk with a kind of try and error situation, you walk, be like, ah, it's a bit too hard, and then you take the key here and you go, and you adjust it yourself, not the doctor. That's true empowerment, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I have to say, you know, Two years ago, more or less, I started to think like there is more than FabLab itself, because FabLab is promoting digital fabrication. But I had this encounter two years ago when I was uh, researching digital wood joinery. We have this ancient joinery from Japan, from the 15th, 16th century. If you look how these craftsmen have made these connections, they're far more sophisticated than whatever we do using digital precision. And that made me think, because you know, like there is this kind of design language as well in Fab Labs. That you see, if you look at boxes made in Fab Lab, mm -hmm. they're always using this joinery, you know? But there's many more than that. So that has become a Fab Lab aesthetics. So I started uh, to look backwards because we are losing our craftsmanship. 
like and even in and that is like happening worldwide we are looking forward 3d printing is the solution for everything digital fabrication is amazing but what about the old crafts and so my goal is to uh, to fuse the two together another another um, example is uh, surface finishing you see a lot of fabla products made there are prototypes and they maybe they're beautiful but most of them they are kind of mm, prototypes but even if they're finished the people never think about surface finishing so if you make a chair from wood and you just mill it out you sand it you glue it together done it's a chair and it works but if you have a party and then somebody spills a glass of wine over it it's game over but if you have surface finished it with a varnish or something and this is a whole big uh, thing again you know, then it's really a true product I think and that's what I like and that's also my goal that uh, I think Amsterdam become also a bit famous because we are really into uh, high quality products that the product should look like that you think like what can I do this in a fab lab really my bass guitar there on the wall that's a product if you look at it it doesn't look like fab lab because it's the combination of craftsmanship and the digital fabrication and high and the finishing absolutely I think it would be even uh, healthy to do that as well. FabLab is basically uh, uh, an experiment laboratory. So you try things out and once you have your prototype, you go to an NGO that makes it for you. But having said that, why not using the machines in the evening and in the weekend for real production? Yeah. Absolutely. And we did it as well and I think we should do it more because I would much more prefer to earn my money like that than asking for a subsidy every now and then. It would be much more healthy if you would be self-sustainable by doing yeah. products. I had many people here, they didn't want even to tell me their ideas because they wanted it to be, be yeah. protected. And then I don't say no, but then you just pay per hour here. We have written the Open Design book as well, Open Design Now book. And uh, we are a member of the Creative Commons uh, in the Netherlands since many, many years, more than 10 years. Uh, that's what we promote and that's what we believe, of course. And if you come here on open day, by the way, to work on the machines and then you have to document, you have to choose on the website a Creative Commons license, so you're protected immediately. But that's the way we work, that's not yeah, necessarily the way the, the general, entire yeah. fabric community uh, works.